So we got a question that he'll be dealing with, and any speaker that wants to come up and comment, you can. Go ahead, Bruce. The question is, how do how does other religious entities such as Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, etc., view the beginning of life? Do they follow? more as evolutionists or creationists as the Bible defines uh, the origin of life. I, as far as Hindus, I, I work uh, with a Hindu fellow. Uh, he's a good guy, I really like him, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's an engineer, very intelligent. And we was riding out uh, looking at some roads one time and we passed a ranch, a cattle ranch, and there were some Bramer cows, some bulls and cows out there. And um, I asked him, all I asked him was, how do you pronounce Bramer or Brahma? Because they would say it Brahma most of the time. Being from a good Texas race boy, I say Bramer. But uh, his answer was, that's our creator. So if you want to know where they think the origin of life is, they believe that the cows created us. However, that works out. But to them, the Bramer is their, one of their gods. And they attribute the creation to the god Bramer or Brahma. So that's, that's their idea. Uh, I would say that Islam would follow more of a, a creator type of uh, scenario based on their view of, of who God is. They claim to worship the God of the Bible, but they do not. Don't ever accept that. But I would say they would lean more to the, the creation side of it. Uh, as far as Buddhists, I'm not sure. Or Sikhism, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody else can speak to that more intelligently. Um, but I do know that the Hindu religion teaches a, a form of uh, reincarnation. And they, they're, they're trying to live a life according to a code of ethics and once they uh, live according to that code well enough then they can reach the state of nirvana and they can get out of the uh, cycle of uh, reincarnation and then go on to the next level of existence so it's uh, way different than what we would think of as uh, a christian religion so Anyway, somebody else want to address that? <laughs> no, I address that? Oh, by the way, I, when we was having our, uh, let, me, let me come back, I forgot. I was going to say something while we was up here. Um, when we was having our, our evolution uh, discussion with the kids from the college, one of the guys got up and he said, I'm a microbiologist. I study things that you can't even see in a microscope. And I said, well, how do you know they're there? He said, well, we can see that how they affect things around them, and we can know they're there by that. And I said, well, you know, that's a lot like I know God is there. That's the same reason I can't see God, but I know He's there because I look at the evidence of creation. And I can, I can trace that back to the only explanation. God is there. He's looking at something that's causing some effects. Something has to be causing it, but He couldn't make the connection. Couldn't make the connection. It's interesting they can make the connection on the biology side of it, but when you get into logic in the Bible, they can't be logical. <laughs> Even though they couldn't see it, they think we have to see God in order to believe in Him. We have one more question that was given to us, and the question was, were all animals saved during or sometime, or were some of them destroyed? Uh, having reference to the flood. So, and the thing was brought up was dinosaurs. So did God put the dinosaurs on the uh, ark uh, or have Noah put them on the ark or were they destroyed? Well, he said he put two of every kind of the unclean, a male and a female, which that would include the dinosaurs. That would include everything. Now, we start thinking about the dinosaurs, we think about them in the stages of being full grown and massive, big as a bus or larger than a bus. Who said God had to do that? 
God said two of every kind of those unclean animals. So it could have been baby dinosaurs. It would take a period of time before they grew so large that they wouldn't be able to fit in the ark. So it, it, when it says he put two of every kind in there, then we can have faith in God that he didn't kill some of them prior to the flood or didn't destroy the species prior to the flood. That happened sometime after the flood. But they were put on that ark and they made it through that whole time. They were off the ark at the end of the flood and it was sometime after that that the dinosaurs went into extinction. Anybody got anything? You might mention about the earth tank so much that it wasn't sustainable. We'll hold on to those things before the flood. No, I thought they were seaworthy in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up here, you going to say something? You got anything, David? Come on up. Well, John really said it when God said that he put those animals on the ark, then he did. But the world changed radically, and I do mean radically, from before the flood to after the flood. And thus, the environment and so forth was, did not sustain a great many things that were before the flood. So some of those animals could have very well died out after the flood. Uh, when you see an alligator, you see a dinosaur. That doesn't surprise us. And when you see a monitor lizard, you see a dinosaur. They're still here. Besides that, if I understand correctly, a lizard never stops growing. Well, God created everything in the beginning full grown. It had a parent age and it had real age. How old was Adam when he was created? Well, literally, he was, if he had lived the day, he was one day old. But he had a parent age of uh, being an adult. Uh, what age adult? I don't know. Young man period. But uh, when it comes down then to sin, sin didn't just affect man. Sin affected the whole world. And uh, thus, when sin got so bad, God destroyed, as we all know, by a flood. But he preserved things for things thereafter in the world in which we live today. So a lot of things just cannot uh, live the way we live today. I don't know that we can properly fathom what the world was like environmentally before the flood. Uh, and we see what happens nowadays. All I know is the promise is from God, contrary to the radical environmentalists today, that seed time and harvest and seasons will continue on to the end of time. And that's going to happen. I don't care what they say. It's going to happen. So when this world comes to an end, yes, you have everything winding down, but it's not going to end in and of itself. God's going to end it. So this world will still be going right on with people giving in marriage, taking in marriage, of whatever's here. Besides that, there are species even dying off the earth today uh, not to come back. Besides, since the flood, you can have all kinds of different kinds. Most dogs living today weren't around five, six hundred years ago. They've been bred up to where they are now. So you've got uh, different breeds of various things existing. Uh, cattle, in fact, if you know anything about cattle, of course you've got different breeds of cattle. I remember just the time when I took agriculture back in high school, you would get to studying the breeds of cattle. Uh, then here later on, 40 years later, 30, 50 years later, you look at cattle that's available now and what they'll recommend in certain parts of the country ought to be raised there from what it was when I was in high school. That had been a big change. So uh, things change. Animals interbreed. They do all that kind of thing. So you've got to realize that. Uh, there's change within a kind. That has nothing to do with the evolutionist saying. You've never seen an alligator turn into one of those brawling cows. It's not going to happen either or vice versa. And by the way, it's the mark of Brom. You ever see a cobra when he sprays his hood and that mark on the back of it? The Hindu will say that's the mark of Brahm, the great god Brahm. The cattle take its name after Brahm. Uh, some of those folks over there with the long white hair and uh, looks worse than Duck Commander or whatever, uh, they are called Brahmin. They are aesthetics. You've got a whole uh, uh, gob of gods <laughs> among the Hindus. And so what they believe about a lot of things 
Uh, the radical ones will wear a mask over their mouth because they're afraid they'll breathe in a gnat and they're afraid that gnat's the reincarnation of their grandmother or something like that. So when they really practice what they believe, their code of conduct, their Bible is a whole list of what's called the Zen Vedas and they study all that stuff. So it gets more complicated to try to understand their view of things in creation than it does to study the Bible and read uh, the truth that Moses wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Is there anything else? In, in my lesson, we talked about the dimensions of the ark and the fact that that was the perfect ratio of being seaworthy. And I'll mention, based on the dimensions, if you have the uh, 17 and a half to 18 inch cubit is what we estimate that it is conservatively. Uh, you, the ark ends up to be 450 feet long, which is a football field and a half length. And 1.5 million cub, uh, cubic feet of space. There's plenty of space. Harry Rimmers uh, was a scientist archaeologist many, many years ago, back in the 1800s. They had a scientific society that offered a reward. I can't remember how much it was, but it's a considerable amount of money back in that day for somebody that could uh, disprove Noah's Ark. And they, there was all kind of people trying to claim that uh, all of those animals couldn't fit on the Ark. And so the first question was, how many animals were there? Does anybody know? David said, two of, uh, or John said, two of the uh, unclean, seven of the clean, uh, are, yeah, clean animals. And so we do know that, but it does say that they took them in by kind. Now, when we think about kind, uh, a bovine, the, those are cows. Equine, that's horses. Right, swine, pigs, radis, radis is mice, um, and so fleas is fleas are fleas, right? So and, and yeah, right, rats have fleas. But the fact is, just because we're going to bring two or seven of each kind, if we're talking about canines, which would be the dogs, that doesn't mean we're going to bring all the chihuahuas and all the poodles and all the Pekingese and all the German shepherds and, and no, we're going to bring canines right? And that doesn't mean every type of canine out there are bovine. That doesn't mean we're going to bring every cow, different type of cow that David was talking about. There's just multitudes. But we're bringing representatives of the kind. Now when we talk about dinosaurs okay, we're going to bring the kind that doesn't mean we're going to bring every different type of dinosaur on the ark. Right? And uh, not to mention the fact, like David said, and this is something to be considered, the face of the earth, the environment, uh, all of the, the, the even atmosphere changed. Up until the time of the flood, it had never rained on the face of the earth. Right? The plants were watered by a vapor. There was a, a canopy over there, kind of like a greenhouse, right? I think you mentioned that. Now the fact is, when that flood came, that canopy dropped, the oceans opened up, that water that's in the ground came up through springs and flooded the earth 40 cubics over the highest mountain. Now think about what that did to the environment and the ecology on the earth and how that would change the habitat for dinosaurs like David said. It would change. It would be so diff so radically different that they may not have been able to survive had they even been on the ark to begin with. But as David pointed out, the kind is covered by such things as alligators and turtles and different things of that nature and lizards and so forth. They are all related to the dinosaur. So, so before we start saying, well, all of those animals couldn't have fit on the ark, well, how many animals are we talking about? The second question is, how big really is the ark? Because we're guessing at it. And so really what these people saying was an indeterminate number of animals couldn't fit on an uh, unknown size ark, right? 
It just doesn't make sense. So basically nobody claimed the reward. Hope that helps. Well, those are the only two questions we were given. Does anyone have Eileen? What is supposed to be the purpose of evolution? Well, you want to answer that? The improvement of a species? Or is what they say it is, there is, really is no purpose of evolution. First off, Evolution is not real. The, the, the type that they're talking about, everybody came from slime in a pit. I'm talking about macro. Okay, you're talking about the evolution that we're talking about, the origin of species and all that. That is false. First off, that is false. The purpose of people hanging on to a false theory that not only cannot be proven, but has been disproven by the ev evidence. The reason they desperately cling to that is that they don't want to accept the alternative, which is a creator. Because if they accept the creator, then they know they have to submit. And I think Eric said, or who was it? Was it Eric or, or John? One of them talked about the humanist that absolutely doesn't want to believe in that. I don't want to believe in God because if I believe in God, I have to submit. So I'll just get rid of all of it and say man is the highest thing there is. And if I'm going to save, be saved, I'm going to have to save myself. And it's not a matter of wanting to believe in evolution. It's, it's, it's a fact that they don't want to believe in God. That's the purpose that they are trying to maintain this false theory and push it so hard. And by the way, if we keep telling our children in schools and other public places, and even nowadays in religion, that they come from an animal, why are we surprised when they start acting like animals? We're teaching our children to be godless in their beliefs and now we're surprised when we have things like mass shootings and, and, and such and people that are just against God and against religion and, and we're surprised. But it's, our, it's, it's society's own doing by promoting these false theories, these false views that take someone, our children, their most precious resource, taking them away from God, away from the Bible, and teaching them nothing but humanism. And we get what we deserve in our society. Bruce used the term humanism. Humanism means that man, not God, man is the measure of all things. Secularism means nothing takes place outside the natural operations of this present world. So when you come to what he said, that they do not want to be a believer in God or anything spiritual. Well, we're all of normal intelligence. If God does not exist, and I look around and see things, then I must come up with the way it got here. But I won't allow God to exist. That does away with the Bible. That does away with the Genesis account of creation. But everything's here. So then they start coming up with how it got here. Now, Darwin was just one. If you go all the way back to the Greeks, you'll find that there's a number of them coming all the way down. And many people in the 16, 1700s, before Darwin ever started anything, and others in the 1800s, who were already saying, you know, I don't believe in the God of the Bible, thus the Bible is not the Word of God, thus the Genesis account of creation is not true because there is no God, so how did things get here? That's how they start that stuff. And that's what Darwin was trying to do when he took his voyage of the bagel, and that's what it was called, and went down to the Galapagos Islands and uh, looked at everything. And without a belief in God, denying God it's called then natural selection so he's coming up with the idea of everything operates within the natural order of things let me say this too 
scientists are the poorest people to debate the existence of God. What do I mean by that? The scientific method means he's anchored, as I think Eric said, to examining things with his five senses. Eric started off, I believe, by saying, what human being was there in the beginning with his five senses to observe the beginning? Well, nobody was. So when you talk about origins, Genesis, the genesis of things, there's no way to apply the scientific method to it. There's no way to observe it. You talk about the five senses, empirical knowledge. What does that mean? It's knowledge that comes through what I can touch, what I can see, what I can smell, what I can taste, what I can hear. And that's all they accept as a way to come to knowledge of anything. But that's not the only way you can come to the knowledge of anything. You can look at something that is designed, see the design in it, and know that there's a designer without ever seeing the designer, without ever smelling the designer, and so forth. How do you know that you have a great-great-great-grandmother? Did you ever see her? No, you never did. Well, then how do you know you had one? It's the way things function. I'm here. I had to have a great-great-great-grandmother the way things work. I use this all the time. People at Spring be tired of it probably. But uh, I know, I know that Saul of Tarsus, in the process of becoming a Christian, repented of his sins. So do you. But there is not one explicit statement that is a statement in just so many words in the New Testament that says Saul of Tarsus in the process of becoming a Christian repented of his sins. It's not there. Well then how do you know? Because you know the rest of the New Testament teaching on the plan of salvation. There it is right there. You can't become a Christian without hearing the gospel, believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, being baptized in Christ, and once a Christian then living steadfastly. Well, let me ask you this. Did Saul of Tarsus become a Christian? Yes, he did. So you know he repented. But it doesn't in just so many words say he repented. Yeah, but he became a Christian. And you'd say, and you can't become a Christian without repenting. And Saul of Tarsus repented in the process of becoming a Christian. So I know that by implication. And that's how we know where there is a design it implies what? A designer. But if you rule out God, you don't want Him there anyway. Thus you ruled out the Bible, the Word of God, or anything else spiritual. But you look around, it's all here. But you don't want to accept God. So now you start theorizing. And coming out with all this stuff like Darwin did, and a whole lot more. That's just the way it works. You reject God, You've rejected all sorts of things that gives you soundness and foundation on every other thing in life itself. Because God is the very origin of life. The very origin of life. Now back in the 60s, James Bales wrote a book on why scientists accept evolution. And uh, some years, quite a few years thereafter, there was another one, I think, by Burt Thompson on why scientists accept evolution. And I know uh, Brother Bales' book the basic understanding of it is look at the background of these scientists all the way back to the 19th century and they accepted the theory of evolution or some kind of theory like that because they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge did that sound like I was quoting scripture they did not like to retain God in their knowledge okay if you don't like God in your knowledge but you're a smart person and your kids say well, where did everything come from daddy well, you're not going to say God created it so you don't believe in him. So you're going to have to tell him that actually you're going to have to tell him nothing got busy and created something. Question. What's the definition of the word nothing? Here it is. The definition of the word nothing is not one thing. That's the definition of nothing. Not one thing. So if you say nothing got busy and created something then you're saying not one thing 
got busy and created something. And your mind goes flutter, flutter, flip, flop, flam, flop, because it didn't work that way. That's when you're, the way God created you begins to butt heads. It won't work. Something doesn't come from not one thing. Something comes from something. And it has to be something capable of creating. So if you don't want to believe in God, and that's really what it comes down to, I don't want to. Because if, if I do believe in God, I'm His creature, and what does that mean my relationship is with Him? i got to obey Him. And He just won't let me do a whole things, a lot of things I want to do. And he has the audacity to say, you're going to stand before me and give an account of deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, I don't like that. I say, and I've said it many times, every atheist, that's the first that says God does not exist, and he thinks he knows it and can prove it. Every atheist is mad at God because he's not God. Back in my younger years, I used to like to read science fiction. One of my favorite science fiction authors was Isaac Asimov, who was a uh, really a microbiologist by training, but he wrote prolifically in science fiction. And um, he, he came up with a, this talking about the Big Bang. And he was actually writing to criticize it, but he revealed some, some things about the thinking of the evolutionist and the origin of, of the universe. And he says, he says uh, if we start at the point of nothingness, that's what David's talking about, right? S nothing. Start at the point of nothingness when there was not one thing and run the film forward, the dot will appear with his unbearably bright heat. Where did the dot come from? Now he goes on to describe this dot this speck, this, this fragment, as something that is without weight and without measurement. Okay, now get that. It, it, it doesn't weigh anything, and you cannot measure it. Right? And so here's the, here's the way this plays out. I'm going to play a, a dual role. One, per, one, one character is going to be dumb, and the other character is going to be dumber. Okay? That has nothing to do with the movie by the same name. But here's... You play both roles well. I know. It's like a, it's, this is like a, a, a role of a lifetime for me. Uh, but, but this one guy got looking this like this. And, and that, that was dumb. And dumber comes over and says, what you looking at? And, and dumb says, nothing. And, and Dummer says, well, how big is it? Yeah, that's what, that's what this is. That's what this is. That's exactly what this is. From, we start out with nothingness, and then we roll the film forward, and here's this speck. Where did that come from? Can't measure it. Has no size, no weight. But it's there. And then that's what eventually goes bang and scatters throughout all of existence. You, you've just given a very, 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 very simple thing and what's very difficult to understand. And I'm not, I don't even know if they understand it of, of what is quantum physics. Yeah. But they're the ones that are coming up and saying there can be some nothing that can cause something. Yeah. But what then, when they end up finishing it up, they're really talking about that knot. Yeah. Which is something. Yeah, they, they have to, you cannot, like David pointed out, start with nothing. If I have nothing in my hand, and I never add anything to my hand, what am I going to have in my hand? And this isn't like Eric's imaginary rock. If I, <laughs> if I, if I have nothing in my hand, and I don't put anything in there, it's, I'm still going to have nothing in my hand. Right? I have to add something to it. Now this is, all of this is because they don't want to admit matter is eternal because of the law of thermodynamics. Right? And we've talked about that. Everything started 
like a clock that's wound up and it's unwinding. And we're in the state of the unwinding part. And one of these days, just by itself, if the creation is allowed to continue, it's going to run down, wear out, and end its own existence. But God has assured us that He's going to end it before that takes place. I thought I was going to have to put a timer on him. <laughs> no, not really. That's a good job. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, oh, hold on. Well, if the big thing happens, would that make it a natural phenomenon? Therefore, it's still going to happen. Should. Should. Yeah. Next big bang is when the elements melt. That's right. That's going to be a big bang for sure. We've been, we've been honing in and focusing on the matter, eternal matter, but, but we have to have eternal space too, somewhere to put the matter. Mm -hmm. Where did the space come from? That's what Eric was talking about, the, the trinity of trinities, time, space, and matter have to exist simultaneously. They can't have one without the other. And they all are created. People don't think about time and space being created, but they're created. Exactly right. Have to be. No other choice. Let's see. Eric? I just wanted to ask a question. If uh, someone chooses to believe a lie, does that lie then come true? No. <laughs> But that's what evolutionists do. They believe a lie, and they try to make it the truth. But a lie is going to be a lie is going to be a lie. It'll never be a truth. John, you probably have to think about that. You referred to this. But you'll remember, you'll remember uh, in the debate with Flu, that Flu begged Brother Warren to just grant him, for sake of evolution and argumentation, enough time for evolution to take place. Brother Warren popped right back up and said, that's the very thing we won't grant you. Because it can't happen. So he wanted to say, will you hedge a little bit and give me the time, and if there's enough time, then evolution can take place. Brother Warren said, no, because there's no, there is no time because evolution can't take place at all. It's an impossibility for, for evolution to take place. Period. That's all there is to it. So they, they, they try to hedge around these things. When in reality, you start out with God. And that's where the Bible starts. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you can't start any better than that. What's interesting about that with flu, he wanted more time. But according to the theory or whatever they want to call it of evolution, they already had about 20 billion years from the Big Bang to the hundreds and hundreds of millions of years they claim that it's, the Earth has been e evolving. What more time does he need? If it wasn't going to do it during that time, it's not going to do it if you granted him another 100 million years or 500 billion years.